Okay, hi everybody. So I'm going to give a, a really short, we're kind of all time, a really short talk now about virtual topologies. Um, the um, the exercise associated with this lecture is just is uh, is carrying on the message around the range. It doesn't matter if you haven't finished that or done all the options. We can go back to that. Um, but before I start, are there any, does anyone have any genuinely any questions at all about about anything you've learned so far or general questions about NPI? Yep. I want to generate like let's assume you're in a Google data Google data center. In a, are they also using NPI? In a Google data center? No. So the reason you wouldn't use MPI for something like that is that MPI is 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 not so so, so MPI's model is that that um, it's tied to the way that supercomputers work. You, you request 120 CPU, 124 CPU cores for two hours. So the MPI's model is that it will going to use all those 1024 CPU cores all the time for two hours, and there will be no faults. The machine will stay up. The network will stay up. There's no concept of elastic. So there is, there is a concept of elasticity of growing communicators, but let's be honest, nobody uses it. It's really not a bit. So MPI is neither fault tolerant nor elastic. So that means that it's not, it would not be, um, you know, would not be the right thing to do for, um, for, for online, you know, for mission critical online stuff. They might use it in the back end for doing large scale data processing, you know, mining the data to find out whether you want to buy Wellington boots tomorrow. Like, you know, that's the kind of things they do. But I don't think they'd use it. They would use a much, so these kind of, I'm not an expert, but these sort of Hadoop, Spark, all these frameworks are fundamentally built on, on being you know, um, elastic and fault tolerant. You know, uh, and not the main thing, it's exactly the opposite end of the spectrum. And what's the technology there? Is it the technology there? Is it just that it's not so much on collaboration like in the um, I mean, I'm not an expert. They do things like, I mean, there's things, I mean, there, the technology there is based so these these frameworks like what are they Hadoop and, and Spark? I'm not an expert, but they're they're fundamentally based on the fact that your data is distributed. So so in parallel computing, we do things in parallel to get a faster answer. We say if we have a thousand processes, we can get an answer quicker. They have a different problem. Their data is distributed because it's been collected in different places and it's huge. So they have to do their analysis in parallel because the data is on physically different systems. It doesn't actually mean, so there was a big, a lot of hoo-ha stories about three years ago when these things started to take up and everyone was saying, oh, you know, we can do HPC applications and, or, or they can say, look, let's take a, let's take a, 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 um, a map produce calculation done through Hadoop or whatever and compare it with the one written in MPI. Of course, the one written in MPI was massively faster, but that's not the point. They're not doing things in parallel to make things go faster. They're doing things in parallel because they have to do things in parallel because the data is, you know, so, so that's, it's a very different model, basically. Um, um, so that's their, I mean, it is parallel, it is parallel processing, but it's not, it's, it's a different model from MPI. And there's been a lot of talk for a long time about making MPI fault tolerance. So, so the argument is, um, it's a, you'll see it written down all the time, but CPU cores aren't getting any faster. To get machines faster, you used to have to use more CPU cores. So we're going to use a million CPU cores, okay? But nobody makes CPUs for high performance computing. It's a vanishing this money market. So you buy CPUs which are in laptops. You'd be an idiot to make a processor last for more than three years. Okay? Why put the money? So three years, a thousand days, if you're across the book, you people buy a new machine. So the meantime between failure is is um, is a thousand days. But then you say, well, if I have a million CPUs, I'm going to have a thousand failing a day. Okay? So you have to have fault tolerance. Well, that 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 argument doesn't really work. It's a, um, actually, things tend to fail early on, and so actually your machine isn't that fault tolerant. B, modern supercomputers are very resilient as a total. So remember, we're running lots of parallel jobs at once. So one node going down doesn't take the whole machine down. And thirdly, I have used machines in the past which were which were not where we had hardware errors. Okay, so the, the argument is very large parallel computers. And I, people, a lot of people disagree with me on this, but I would say the argument is very large parallel computers will have hardware errors because you cannot make things reliable enough so that when you have a million that they don't go wrong. That's impossible. Um, 
I used a machine back in 1990, 91, 92 that had hardware errors. When you did floating point computation, you weren't guaranteed to get exactly the right result. Okay? It, it is impossible to use a machine which has hardware errors. It is impossible, in my opinion. You know, everything you do, the way we program, is based on the machine. So, 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 so what you really want is something which is guaranteed to crash when it goes wrong. You know, that, and that's, that's MPI's model. If anything goes wrong, I will abort, right? And actually, that, that's, I think that's probably. And if you say that, again, this is, not, this is not the party line, so we should probably delete the recording. But if you say that, well, that means we can't get computers faster than we have today. <clears throat> well, maybe. I mean, people tried to build aircraft like can, uh, um, um, commercial aircraft that went faster than the speed of sound, twice the speed of sound. Isn't it terrible that jumbo jets are limited by the speed of sound? You build a, a, an aircraft that goes twice the speed of sound, it works, it's a death trap, it's a commercial failure. It's just, you know, that's the sweet spot. The sweet spot is big jumbo jets at 700 miles an hour, 600 miles an hour, 600 miles, whatever they go, you know. Maybe, maybe this is just the sweet spot. Maybe this is just the natural size that computers get to. And you buy more of them. You know, you buy 10 of them rather than one of them. I don't know. But um, so anyway, that's a bit of an aside. But, you know, a lot of the stuff that people can talk about in MPI, fault tolerance and stuff like that, elasticity just does not really, in my opinion, fit to what people actually do. So that's that sort of. Um, anyone have any other questions? Yeah, good question. So, around data storage and applications, yeah. so I'm designing the model and I need to run on average PC. So, I'm going to use a database basically to handle all the data and fill out a chunk process and put it back basically yeah. to work or manage. In a huge application like on a supercomputer, um, is it worth implementing a database, some kind of database system? Or no. So, so, basically, the model people have is that you know, CPU time costs a lot of money. So the model is, you would have, possibly have a pre-processing stage to bring the data, to, to aggregate the data, bring it on, and a post-processing. So we have a separate system on Archer, two separate systems on Archer for doing pre- and post-processing. And that time isn't even charged, that's free time. Um, but you know, if you've just, you know, when you're running an IO, I mean, there used to be a, a joke, it's not even a joke, I think it's true, that parallel computing was a way of turning a CPU limited problem into an IO limited problem. So, and, and in fact, you know, it's becoming a real issue. So the idea is once you finish your job, you, you, you just want to get the data off as soon as possible. So you just want to dump the data to disk as soon as possible, as quickly as possible, and then cope with it offline in some sense. And there are, MPI does have MPI IO as part of MPI, which is a reasonably elegant way or there are higher level things like HDF5 and NetCDF, but there are well-established ways of doing that. But they're very much like, let's write a terabyte of raw data to disk now, please. And then, I, and then you might then drain that off into a, um, but it doesn't really, it doesn't really lend itself. It's, it doesn't mean you can't store the data in a database further down the line, but the model would be, so they don't tend not to do live visualization, you know. Every time you spin something, you've wasted a million, CP, you know, a thousand CPU hours. You know, you just want to, you get the data off. Then you have offline systems, which sorry, not offline, but systems attached to the same storage, which do do that. That would yeah. be more so kind of strategy Yes, yeah. So you would have a pre-processing stage to pull the data out, run the model, dump it, and then a post-processing stage maybe to push the data back into a database. That would, that would be my model of how you would do that. Okay, so what you've actually covered in the lectures so far. Um, really the core of MPI. We've covered yesterday how you start a process, how you send messages, send and receive, and some of the subtleties. And then today, um, Rupert talked about uh, non-blocking, which is the canonical way of, of um, making sure you have deadlock free, breaking the deadlock, where you basically offload. You say to MPI, rather than deliver this message and, and let me know when it's finished, or uh, to be honest, it's the receive that's really an issue. You know, issue or receive and, and, and wait till it's finished. You say to your guy, could you please deliver this message in the future and I'll come back to you and check whether it's been delivered. Could you please receive this message sometime in the future and come back and see when it's come in. And then the collective stuff which Juan gave is absolutely crucial to, to you know, if there's one section of the MPI manual you should read, it's the collectives, just so you know what's there. So when you do something, you say, oh, there's a collective in the group. But the things we're going to cover this afternoon, we're actually calling some derived data types, are slightly more abstract. You will see programs that never use these. However, they are 
I did consider for a while whether it was worth keeping this in, in, in this course. Uh, but I think they are because if you read the most recent edition of the, the, the textbook that I, I, I mentioned at the start, the um, uh, Rock, Lusk and Skelly textbook, they go through at the start the design parameters of MPI and they're very proud of two things. One is virtual topologies and one is derived data types. And they can be very, very useful. So um, I'll go through what virtual topologies are. So virtual topologies give you a convenient process in ADT. The other reason to do virtual topologies is if it's the first time we'll actually do something with a communicator. We'll actually manipulate communicators rather than just relying on MPI on their own. It gives you a naming scheme to fit the communication pattern. I'll come back to that. It can, it can simplify the writing of code, and in principle, it allows MPI to optimize the communication. So I'll cover all those things. Now, unfortunately, the exercise that we have associated with this lecture is somewhat contrived, um, but it's worth doing it because at least it gets you uh, familiar with the syntax. So, what a virtual topology is, is basically what MPI Comworld is just a bag of processes, okay? It contains maybe 24 processes, 124 processes, whatever. And there's no structure to that. You may think, oh, I actually think I want these processes to be arranged in a line. So rank N is next to N plus, or you might do in, in a 2D or 3D grid. But, but there's none of that is communicated to MPI. You just have, you can do it yourself. You can say, well, rank seven is at position two comma one comma two, but, but you haven't given that information to MPI. So uh, a virtual topology is a way of actually creating a communicator which has structure. It isn't just a bag of end processes. They, they know that they're inside the structure. And then having done that, this is called the topology, MPI gives you mapping functions. So rather than saying, you can say things like, what, what is the rank of position five at uh, uh, grid corners three, two, seven? who is up for me in the X direction, which is a more natural way, at least in scientific and technical applications, of referring to the, to the, um, to the processes. And uh, there, so, yeah, so there's, and the mapping functions give you the process of ranks based on the topology of the So, an example is, I'm just talk, this is not very well. The idea here is that you've designed a, an application where you want the processes to be arranged in a, in a 2D grid. So imagine, I mean, so, so we're doing some, we're doing some sort of fluid dynamics here. It doesn't matter if you're not a fluid dynamic person. But we've got a channel, say. So this, and then we've got fluid flow going through here, okay? And what we want to do is we want to paralyze this. The natural way to paralyze it is to split it up into, I think you can use those lines, into a, into a grid. Say, four, um, this is a, a grid of, a pro, each grid, um, each, each process, Oh, sorry, no, well, sorry. Each process has a different area of the simulation. So here you want to think of your ranks, your MPI process of being in a grid, because this process will want to communicate with its neighbors up, down, left, and right, okay? Um, and so what you can do is you can tell, you can do that in MPI. You can say, look, I actually want my here 12 processes to be arranged in a grid. But not only is there, is there grid information, there's other information in, in this diagram. In particular, uh, in this simulation, if I have fluids flowing from left to right, I might say, well, what happens when the fluid hits this end? Well, I want to simulate an infinite pipe, so I'll have periodic round of it. And I'll say that the fluid that goes off the right comes back in on the left, okay? It's like my roundabout in the traffic model. So what that's saying is the neighbor of this process to the right is this process. They're looped round. But not in this direction. We have hard walls to see. Who's my neighbor that? Well, there isn't a neighbor there. I'm not doing any communication there. So, so, so this, this is called a Cartesian topology, and it has two features. One is it has um, a set of a regular uh, set of dimensions here, um, two by three, uh, a three by four, sorry. Um, but also there's information on the bound conditions, what happens at the edges, and you can encode both of those into um, into a Cartesian topology. And the way it works is that. Um, MPI, once you will do the setup routines, once you've told MPI this information, you can talk start talking about what is the process at position one, two, and that will be rank six. Or you can ask who is who is um, in this dimension up for me. I hate so that I don't want my rank about matrices, but I should read you all this diagram. This is drawn as a as, as a matrix as if it were I down the wave and J along, which people love to do. But that means that up is down. Increasing I is down the way. So so up, so I, never, I don't actually know anyway, going down the way. 
is, um, so you can ask them that, and you can ask who's my neighbor that way, and you would say, well, there isn't one. You can say, who's my neighbor that way, and you can say, it's this guy here. Now, this isn't rocket science. You can do this yourself. It's not hard to write code to trans translate, you know, uh, to, to create a linear mapping from a, from a 2D or 3D space, well, into, into linear coordinates. Uh, having, but if you get to three or four dimensions, it gets a bit of a hassle. Um, but the, the, the nice thing about doing this is, is, A, it gives you a code, a standard look and feel. If someone looks at your code and they see MPI can't create, it's immediately clear, oh, this he, is, he or she is, 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 is creating um, a, 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 a Cartesian topology rather than some bizarre um, lookup table you've created yourself. Secondly, it's standard. Um, and um, thirdly, in principle, uh, it allows MPI to do some optimization. So you can actually have, I've talked about Cartesian topologies. Each process is connected to its neighbor in a virtual grid. And the way this, the reason this is useful is it's a standard way of writing parallel programs. Uh, the boundaries can be cyclic or not. You may or may not want cyclic boundaries. And actually, optionally, you can reorder the ranks to allow MPI to, 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 um, to, to um, optimize communication. So in principle, what you can say to MPI is, I know, I'm going to be thinking of my, 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 my processes as being in this, this, this 2D grid. So then MPI can infer that the communications is going to be up, down, left, right. And then it might say, oh, well, actually, this would run a lot faster on this particular machine, given its network topology, if, I, uh, if, I, if, if, if rank 7 now become rank 3 and rank 5 became rank 9. So MPI, in principle, it can reorder, can renumber your, your, I mean, logically renumber your, um, your, your process ranks to, 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 um, to optimize them. You can also have graph topologies. So I mean, if you're doing any kind of unstructured problem, which is any sort of data science problem or, or, or something using finite element tetrahedral triangles and stuff like that. You will, have, you, will, you will not end up with um, a regular connectivity. You will have processes in some, uh, in some mesh, connected to all of it regular, and connected to each other in weird and wonderful ways. I'm just a triangular one there. But you can see that you know you get to come with a more general structure. And this is more general for two reasons. A, you don't have a fixed number of neighbors, because um, you know, that, that guy has one, two, three neighbors, this guy has one, two, three. Five neighbors, and B that the connectivity is is, is random. So there's no there's no sense who's up from them. You, you, you can say who are my neighbors and how many of them are. Now I'm not going to cover that here, but but because um, until recently the interface was rather poorly designed and didn't give you many advantages. Actually, they've redesigned the interface recently. It's a bit better. But but graph topologies do exist. So if you're doing unstructured problems, you might want to look at at, um, at, at <coughs> if you get to a situation where you want to know that each process has a, has, a, has a random number of neighbors and you have to do lots of indexing and stuff like that. You might want to look into that. But the concept is the same, as, as, although the implementation is different. So how do you create the Cartesian topology? Well, basically, you start off with an old communicator, which is the existing communicator, which could be MPI com world, and you tell MPI how many dimensions there are, might be two dimensions, uh, what they are, three by four, for example, the periodicity, and a little array of, is it periodic in each dimension? Uh, a flag called reorder, which tells MPI, are you allowed to reorder these? It's saying, look, if reorder is false, it means that your rank in the new communication is the same as the rank in the old communication. But if reorder is true, then MPI is allowed to renumber. Now, there's no, there's no physical moving. Your process doesn't get up and move to another CPU. It's just that logically, you might be ranked seven in the world, but now ranked three in, in, in the new communicator. Okay, so it's a logical number, and there's no physical movement of data or anything like that. And you get back a new communicator. And the thing which is different about this communicator, although it contains all the same processes as this one, okay, this has 12 processes, this would have 12 processes, um, because um, it now has a structure. So now you can ask things about it. You can ask that communicator, how big are you? What are your dimensions? Who's up from you? Who's down from you? In Fortran, it's just the same. Cobol, then they, they appear to be all the up. So you might then say, okay, so I'm running on 2,948 processes, and I want a 3D decomposition of those processes. Okay, is that 16 binary counts if my head hurts? So MPI gives you a bit of just some bookkeeping, uh, bookkeeping uh, um, calls 
called dimmed create. All dimmed create does is it takes a number, which is the number of nodes, which is the number of processes, and, and gives you a suggested decomposition. But you don't have to use this. You can write lots of complicated code with square roots and cube roots and ceilings and floors if you feel like it. But you can just use this, and it just gives you MPI dimmed create. It says, uh, you're saying, I've, I've got this many um, processes, which will be the size of, this, of the communicator, and I want a, a dimension, this number of dimensions, and please tell me what the dimensions are. But that, could, that actually, you know, in, in on its own, that can be very useful. Because if you want to, say, if you've got a 3D problem and, um, and you've got some, some uh, I mean, we like to think of using power of two processes. That's, things were nice in the old days. Yep. No, if you wanted to, say, do a 2D calculation. Yeah. Sort of, um, yeah. And you did um, Yeah. The other way around, you dim freight first. So can't well, can't I don't know because this is this quite can't freight you tell it what the dimensions are. This is a helper function. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Um, yeah. Is, that, is there a way of taking into account the size of the subdomain? Let's say you have a channel which is longer. Ah, uh, okay. No. So so you're right. So this doesn't actually this doesn't have any this doesn't have any information on the problem size. So it will it will give a balanced decomposition. It will try and come up with a decomposition where the numbers are close. But you're right, that may not be appropriate if you have an unbalanced problem domain. There, there is a trick actually which, which might help there, but I'll come up with that next slide. That is a very good question. This is an abstract thing. Uh, you're right, in reality, you might say, well, actually, I want a decomposition which gives me locally cubic domains, for example. And then, and then you'd want them. That, that, that doesn't, that's a, that doesn't isn't included here. That's a good point. I mean, I like to think about power two processes, but unfortunately, um, nowadays processes, um, because we have multi core processors which have semi random numbers of CPUs in them, we don't get nice power to two. So, for example, Arch is made up of nodes with 24 cores because it has two 12 core CPU processors. I think on our Cirrus system they have 18. I've heard of even worse numbers. Um, anyway, they just stick as many. Well, they don't actually. What they do is they stick as many on as they can, they let a couple fail, and then sell you, you know, they stick 20 on, they test them, and then they, they turn on to two, say, for example, on the assumption that, you know, they, they, I mean, something. they stick 20 on, and then they and then they, they they're going to give you 18, but they they, they they mask out any that are broken. And if none are broken, they still mark. No, if none are broken, they sell them as a premium product. Is the other thing. So so I used to say that the, 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 the slightly making stuff. The PlayStation 2, which had the um, the IBM, which what was the one was called? Cell. Cell. Yeah. Sorry, I'm going to see now. The cell processor. I think if you bought if if you bought one of them for a for a supercomputer, the cell had like eight. I think it had eight processors on it, but the PlayStation had seven because it was just all the ones that one had failed. They just mask it out. And that, that's the usual thing. Um, so so MPI dims create. What is slightly weird in MPI dims create, but is actually useful, is that the on entry these values are significant. That's the biggest. Mistake. So on entry you can provide value. So if on entry they're zero, you're telling MPI that you can it, it has a free choice. So if you say MPI dims create, I've got six processes, two dimensional grid, and you're not specifying anything that come back to three, two, or two, three, or something like that. MPI dims create seven, two dims is saying I've got seven processes, I've got a two dimensional decomposition, and I'm not giving you any constraints. Well, there's one seven and seven one are the only two possibilities. Um, however, if on entry, one of these is is a non-zero number, then MPI takes that as a constraint. So in your problem where you wanted to, you know, you, you can't hint to MPI that you'd like more in this dimension. You can give it a number. You might say, well, this dimension is very small, so I only want two or four. So if you say, I want the three dimensions to be composition of six processes, and I want the middle dimension to be three, there's only two answers, two, three, one, and one, three, two. Of course, you can get erroneous calls. You do MPI dim to create seven three dim seven three where you've got your three zero. You're saying I want a three dimensional decomposition of seven processes where the middle dimension is three. That doesn't work, so you get an erroneous call. And in fact, I think this will actually crash your program. So this is the classic error: make sure that dims is set to zero before the call, otherwise you might get weird results. And it is nothing more than the helper function, but it, it can be quite useful. And I said, if nothing else. When you write a program using these calls, it's very obvious to anyone else looking at the code what you're doing. 
you know, oh, democratic cats, okay, that's fine, hands up with what, what, what they're doing, rather than some, some strange um, self written look up to him. Yep? So, does it know, have any sense of hardware? Because if I have 24, <coughs> yeah. Most calculations typically here and there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, of course, you could put those processes everywhere, but the panel doesn't know about the distribution of those. So, as I said, the idea is if you then, so this, this, this has got, this is completely hardware independent. This is just saying if I've got 16 processes and I want a three dimensional composition, then four by four by two looks like a good idea. However, if you then, when, then when you call MPI, can't create. If you specify reordering equals true, then it, in principle, can then rearrange them and and, do, do, and put them at a, a, a better place. For example, now I have I haven't done the test for a while, but a few years ago I did a test, and I only found one MPI distribution then which did this, which actually took advantage of this and it did a terrible job. So um, it's up to you whether you. Uh, I don't know if the Cray does a, uh, if the, what the Cray does, but whether the, the, the Cray implementation of MPI does anything with this. Um, it's there as a possibility. In practice, in practice, on something like the Cray, when you launch a program, remember I said you can do AP run minus little n four, more, but you can also do a capital M, which is how many processes you can have. In fact, on the Cray, you can actually give a completely verbatim list of which process goes to which processor. And that's external from the program. That's an, and actually what people really do is that they don't use the internal MPI thing. What I would recommend is you set the order equals false, but then you play around when you run the program. And in fact, there's a Cray tool called CrayPad, which is a performance runner. There's a, there's a there's a virtual tutorial on using CrayPad that um, Rick Gordon did a couple of months ago. Uh, and that will monitor your communication on a real run, look at what the communications were, and actually say to you, I think this distribution of processes, the processors would be the best thing. And then you can just rerun with that. And you don't even have to change the executable. That's the nice thing. It's just, you know, try it. If it goes faster, it's a freebie. If it doesn't, well, hey ho. So, uh, you know, typically, Actually, people tend to play around with these things um, external to the program. But that's the logic, that's the reason for being there. So once you've done that, you now have your processes in a grid. Uh, you have some mapping functions. I always get these the wrong way around. Mapping process grid coordinates. Right. Okay, so you can see within this communicator, who is the rank of these coordinates? So you, you give it, you give some coordinates, four comma two comma seven, and you say who is who, who is the rank at that at that um, at that position? And the inverse is clear and useful mapping ranks to process coordinates. <coughs> you say, okay, within this Cartesian communicator, what are the coordinates of this rank? Give me the uh, um, you get a little array back of the coordinates of this rank. Now, um, just as a word of warning to Fortran programmers. Uh, there are two C-isms in this. First of all, rank zero is at position zero, zero, not one, one. But actually, not only that, um, MPI prescribes, so MPI prescribes the mapping, and it uses a C-like mapping in the sense that rank one is at position zero, one. If you're a Fortran programmer and, you're, you, and you're, you think about the way that Arrays work in Fortran, it might be more natural to you to think of rank one at being position one zero, but it isn't. It uses C like indexing, C like indexing in terms of starting at zero, but also C like, if you like to call it row column major. I've never understood that term, anyway. Um, I've never understood this, this row column major but, um, terminology, but it uses, it's maybe not using that. It doesn't matter, as long as you're self consistent, it, it'll be okay. Um, so, what you can see is that the, the thing which people get until recently, not well, I'll clarify this, but if you're going to do communication, you're going to end up doing this all the time. You're going to say, what are my coordinates? You're going to add one or subtract one to one of those coordinates to find out the coordinates of the neighbor in your x, y. And then you're going to say, what are the coordinates of my neighbor? And that all the, because when you do send receive, you still send and receive to a rank. You don't say send a message up, send a message left, send a message right. What you do is you use 
this technology to work out what the rank of the process up, down, left, right is, and then just you do a normal send. So, so, so that might seem a bit, that might seem not particularly elegant, but it's very long-winded if you have to say, what am I, who am I, what are my coordinates, add or subtract one to each of those, and say who is the guy at those coordinates, and then send a message to that person. So MPI wraps this up in a very useful function called MPI can't shift, which basically, for a particular dimension, works out who your neighbors up and down are in that dimension. And you can, um, up or down is, well, up or down is following the conventions of MPI send receive. I can never remember the MPI, what the conventions of MPI send receive are, but I'll to look. Because uh, it, it, it's whether you think of these as active or passive shifts. Yeah? Is there a way of, let's say you need to communicate not just the one dimension, but off dimensions? Are there any functions with passive and topology? Oh, you mean for doing diagonals? You would have to do a. That's a very good point, actually. You have to do any cell. I guess you could do the graph topology. Well, that would be overkill, because you want to tell MPI. So for the diagonals, that's actually a, okay. So that is a that is a weak spot in the standard because um, no, you'd have to do that yourself. Well, you'd have to do you have to add or maybe they find that that is a weak spot. The reason it's a weak spot is this does two things. A it so so direction is is it the x y or z dimension and then number not one two so the first index of your array is the zeroth dimension, it does your head in a bit. Dis Dispis displacement, which is one, two, three, you know, how, so normally it'd be up, on, up, up, up or down one, but you can ask for your near, next nearest neighbors. And then this tells you who's to the left and this tells you who's to the right. But the problem is, I was going to say you could do it, but you can't, because the weird thing about this point, I've always thought it's weird, is this is saying, what is the coordinates of this rank? Sorry, what is the rank of these coordinates? Or more importantly, this one, what are the coordinates of this rank? Now, you might pass your own rank here, but it doesn't happen. You can say, what are the coordinates of that rank, that rank? The weird thing about MPI can't shift is it is implicitly me. This is saying, who are my neighbors, up or down? So if you could, it would be much more natural to have, then you could do a shift of a shift here. So the other thing which MPI can't shift does is it is respect to the boundary conditions. That's why MPI can't shift is useful because it respects the, the boundary conditions. It, it, it will wrap around. But you're, you're right, you'll have to do it yourself. Unless, I should maybe look up and maybe. Yeah. Um, the The problem about that is it doesn't respect the boundary conditions. You have to do it yourself, which kind of blows the whole thing away. So uh, that's a very good point. I won't. Uh, you'd think that you'd have to, you'd have the MPI card shifts where you had an array of displacements, for example, would be the natural thing to do, you know, up or down in, in some. I should look at it. I'll look at the manual. You'd think that'd be an obvious thing to fix. Um, so, what if you ask the rank non existent processor, well, they're the edge of, of a non periodic grid? Well, actually, this isn't quite true, but. If you ask for the rank of non-existent processor, you get an error. But but if you if you if you um, do a shift in a non-periodic grid, so so what I'm saying is imagine you, imagine you're saying if you've got a periodic grid and you're on the edge, you say who's my neighbour up the way? It gives you the guy on the end. It, it wraps around. What happens if we're in that in that uh, CFD example? We say who is my neighbour up there? There isn't a neighbour up the way. You get this processor called MPI prop null, and that's really nice because. MPI prop null is like a black hole, it's like dev null. Send to receive complete, complete immediately, the send buffer, the CPS receive buffer isn't touched. And that's nice because it means you don't have to write special code for the boundaries. You don't have to say, if I'm on the top, then don't send a message up the way. You can just say, who's my neighbor, send a message. And if you're on the top, you get an MPI prop null and the message just disappears. That actually allows you to write much more elegant code because you don't have to um, have special code for the boundaries. So that's actually quite nice. The other really nice thing about um, about um, uh, Cartesian topologies is you can slice them up. So let's imagine we have a grid like this. The grid of processes which have some values in them. We've all got some value x, y, z, something like that. 
this is a grid, a 4 by 4 grid of crosses. If I wanted to add up all the, all the values, I, I've got a matrix, I want to compute the total sum of all the elements in the matrix, okay? So each process can complete the, compute the local sum. How do I add up, what's the best way to add up all the elements across the whole array? Across the whole matrix, not the whole matrix. How can I add up all the elements? I've got a single number on each process, I want to add them all together, what should I do? And all reduce, all reduce, right? I should do that, fine. But what happens, so there's a routine MPI all reduce which says, Add up these numbers over everybody. What happens if I just want to have the sum of the columns? I just want to do a summation across there. There is no do an MPI all reduce just over the columns. There's one there's one call, MPI all reduce. How do you think I can do that? Yes. So the important point is the the reduction, the, the collective observation is take a communicator as an argument. So in MPI, the philosophy is if you want to do a collective operation on a subset of processes, there are special routines. You just create a communicator, which is that subset. And that's particularly easy when you've, when you've already told the MPI, my, my process is from a 4 by 4 grid. Now you can say, well, I want to slice it up vertically. And there's a routine called MPI cart sub, which a new community has produced for each slice. And this only makes sense with the Cartesian topology. If you said, could you slice up MPI congruent, the MPI would say, that's just a bag of processes. I don't know what you're talking about. Once you've told it your process is in a 4x4 grid, you can slice up. And once you have these subcommunicators, you can then do collective operation. And this is a thing you might want to You might want to know what is the sum of all, this, all the, the columns of this distributed matrix. You shouldn't program it yourself. You should use a reduction operation if you pass a communicator, which is a subcommunicator. So MPI can't sub generate new communicators for the slices. And you use an array to specify which dimension should be retained. I always have to look this up, but basically you, you say, you tell it, MPI cap sub, here's my original communicator, which clearly has to be a kind of easy communicator. You give it an array telling it which dimension should remain. So I guess here, if I've drawn it like this, it means the first dimension should remain in the second dimension. It's because if you have a 3D grid, you could, you could, you could cut it up into slices or pencils. You know, there's various options. You maybe need to get your head around that. But clearly, it's something that you can do. And that is another um, nice thing to do, that um, one, of the, one of the most common uses for, for, um, for, for Cartesian communicators is that to allow you to create a process, uh, um, uh, communi create communicators which are subgrids of, of the main grid. So for example, if you've ever done, if you've ever done a 3D Fourier transform, you may know that 3D Fourier transform is nothing more than a bunch of 1D Fourier transforms in each dimension. Okay, uh, so um, but uh, what I'm trying to say that's maybe a complicated example, but, but but it can be a useful thing to do. You often would want to create take a 3D communicator and, and, and split it up into planes, into slices, which will then allow you to do independent 2D Fourier transforms in each of the planes independently. So exercise six on the grid on, on it is slightly is slightly contrived because clearly in one dimension, working out your neighbors isn't that hard. Doing rank plus one, rank minus one, and then doing a bit of mod this and that isn't particularly rocket science. So but it is a useful programming exercise to create your net to calculate your neighbors using a Cartesian topology. Clearly in one D it's a bit of, it's a bit heavyweight, but at least it gets you if you're interested in using Cartesian topologies, then programming the 1D exercise is useful just to get you thinking about it. So, so you create the 1D topology, and then you can use MPI card shift. If you specify the boundary conditions correctly, it will do them for you. And there is an, there's an additional exercise which, which allows you to play around the boundary conditions. You can run the same code as you've written, but with different boundary conditions, and you have to get a slightly different results, which I think is interesting. Um, however, if you haven't completed the message around the ring, don't jump to this exercise. Complete the message around the ring example first. Um, because that, uh, this is really an extension to that, but it, it is trying to make it as interesting as possible. Um, slightly contrived, but not completely contrived. Now again, derived data types are, again, some people don't use them, but I'll just flag up in advance. We don't cover it in this course, but there is a whole section of the standard that's devoted to parallel I.O., and that's probably the first problem you hit when you do real parallel applications, how do I get my data in and out? And Derived data types are absolutely fundamental to the way that MPI gets parallel I.O. So uh, again, 
it, it is worth, this is a very important lecture, although we're not talking about it now, if you ever wanted to do parallel I.O. using MPI, then you need to understand the right data types. Um, so that's a good, it's, uh, it's useful to do that. Okay.